management. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Hussein, and we will ask you after you finish your presentation. Thank you very much indeed. So, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahim, Assalamu alaikum, Jamiyam, Hattubah, Barakatuh. Thank you very much, Prof, for your kind invitation, and uh, it's a pleasure to me uh, to be with you guys in this amazing conference so far. So, uh, within the next uh, 30 minutes, I will shed a light on congenital hyperinsulinism. Here are my disclosures. And uh, I will cover some pathophysiology of hyperinsulinism. Then, how could we reach a differential diagnosis for uh, congenital hyperinsulinism, and how can we manage this case? Um, so, congenital hyperinsulinism is the commonest cause of recurrent and persistent hypoglycemia in infants and children, and it can be presenting with different kind of features and uh, symptoms. So, neonates, uh, neonatal hyperglycemia, then it becomes uh, persistent or recurrent, and that would be one of the features of how it presents. Sometimes it presents for first time with seizures, and then with the workup of that seizure, you discover that this patient is having hypoglycemia. Sometimes developmental delay due to recurrent, untreated, unrecognized hypoglycemia, lethargy, of course, and tiredness, uh, and responsiveness, and coma, and then that would work up will find hypoglycemia. So the presentation of, hyper, of, of, of congenital hyperinsulinism basically depends on the hypoglycemia, how it manifests itself. Causes of hyperinsulinism, we can divide it into three categories, and perinatal factors, for example, as opposing factors for hyperinsulinism. Uh, that could be related to stress-induced hyperinsulinism in cases of small progestational age, IUGR, prematurity, Extraordinary resuscitation, maternal preeclampsia, sometimes even with the insertion of uh, arterial lines. Uh, hyperinsulinism can be also associated with a number of syndromes, like Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome, uh, Kabuki syndrome, and Turner syndrome, or could be more uh, related to a gene defect, and this is what we call it monogenic defect, uh, uh, cause of hyperinsulinism. So the monogenic defect, uh, so far plus 12 genes being recognized, the most commonly uh, recognized gene and most common cause of congenital hyperinsulinism is something related to the potassium ATP channel in beta cells and mutation usually uh, caused by ABCC8 gene mutation or KCNJ11. And that will lead to dysregulation of uh, insulin secretion, and I will show that in illustration in the next couple of slides. Those babies with these gene mutations usually born large for gestation, so they'll be microsomic, and the glucose load or glucose infusion rate is greater than eight milligram per kg per minute. Normally, the glucose requirement is four to six milligram per kg per minute, so if it proceeds and increases, the glucose requirement, then that could be an indication of ongoing hyperinsulinism. So clinicians need to be aware of this. Other genes, rather than the ABCC8 and KCNJ11, as listed in, uh, on this slide. So let's go through this illustration, trying to understand a little bit on how the hyperinsulinism occurs. So if we have high glucose in the circulation, this is a normal physiology, high glucose, means the glucose goes inside the cell, and that will increase the metabolism, resulting into a more uh, ATP uh, in proportion to the ADP. So that increase the, in the ATP that will enhance the potassium to go outside this, uh, the, the, the cell and through the, the potassium ATP channel, the, the ATP channel. Closure of this channel will result in depolarization of the membrane, Depolarization of the membrane will enhance the calcium influx, and when the calcium gets inside the beta cell, the insulin will be released outside. This is what happens normally when we have high glucose. If we have low glucose normally in normal physiology, uh, so low glucose means low, low metabolism, and low metabolism, of course, will mean low ATP proportion to the AD. Therefore, there will be no outflux of potassium and no calcium influx because the membrane will be hyper-repolarized and therefore no calcium influx, no insulin secretion. What happens with the potassium ATP defect is these channels are defective. So regardless that you have low glucose and regardless that there is no actual 
So regardless low glucose, regardless the low metabolism and low ATP production, but these channels are always closed and making the depolarization of the membrane and that leads to calcium influxing and the calcium influxing leads to insulin secretion outside. And that is causing hyperinsulinism. That is worrisome because already low glucose, already high insulin secretion in the, uh, in the circulation, and that insulin usually suppresses the uh, ketogenesis process. Therefore, the patient will end up with having no, uh, uh, no fuel to the to the important cells in the body, like the brain cells, you have no glucose already and no ketones, which is the, uh, because of the suppressed ketogenesis process. Therefore, uh, the patient will be at risk of brain damage. Other genes can be uh, affected in the case of hyperinsulinism. We just knew about the KCNJ11 and the DCC8 working on these channels, but we have other genes working on the transporter cells or glucokinase. Uh, gene which is affecting the glucose and the uh, formation of G6DP uh, or uh, uh, the GLH uh, uh, gene mutation also. Other rare types of uh, hyperinsulinism due to blood one mutation, and this one is associated usually hyperinsulinism with hyperammonemia, so the, the patient will have very high ammonia levels and will have a very interesting presenting features, usually will have uh, hypoglycemia postprandially, uh, or sometimes even with a fasting, and more uh, sensitive to the diet that's containing high protein uh, in that. They, they could have epilepsy, and interestingly, they are responsive to disoxide. HNF4-alpha, or HNF1-alpha, is another cause of uh, hyperinsulinism, and these gene mutations usually uh, presenting in the family. So there will be family history of diabetes mellitus and the same genes could be upregulatory or downregulatory. So for example, at some point would be leading to hyperinsulinism, but at early adulthood will be responsible and the same patient for developing MODI, uh, uh, the maturity onset diabetes of you. And good, uh, good news is, uh, is diazoxide responsive as well. So uh, it's important then to differentiate and to know there are two types of hyperinsulinism. It could be focal, only one area, usually less than one centimeter, is responsible for all the amount of insulin that's been secreted leading to hypoglycemia, or could be diffuse, the whole pancreas is affected. And genetic testing can help us to predict which type are, are we dealing with. So if we have the homozygous by allelic mutation of ABCC8 or KCNJ11, then most likely we are dealing with diffuse hyperinsulins. Whereas if it comes only paternally inherited mutation, heterozygously, then perhaps we are dealing with focal uh, congenital hyperinsulinism. Of course, we need a scan to uh, confirm the diagnosis and because the management would be different afterwards. Why is it important for us to have a prompt response? Uh, why, is it, why is that necessary? Because if Hyperinsulinism is exists and is existing, and uh, there is a delayed diagnosis. So patients would be having uh, perhaps developmental uh, issues, uh, speech delay, learning disability, behavioral issues, something related to autism as well, and ADHD, or even uh, as severe as physical disability. So basically, we would like to treat patients, diagnose them early, treat them properly to prevent any sort of brain damage. Management of congenital hyperinsulinism um, depends on uh, four pillars. First of all, we need to treat the hypoglycemia that led to the diagnosis initially. So we would treat that immediately by giving like a fluid bolus, like two milk a kg uh, with 10% dextrose, followed by maintenance infusion. And then we calculate the glucose infusion rate. And based on that, we see how the hypoglycemia is responding. We need to establish diagnosis and establishment of diagnosis heavily depending on getting the critical sample at time of hypoglycemia. It, it doesn't matter that you collect the critical sample afterwards because that will not uh, test the mechanisms that are supposed to counteract the hypoglycemia. So it's important, very important to collect a critical sample at time of hypoglycemia to get uh, the biomarkers that you need uh, to help you reaching a differential diagnosis and perhaps the congenital hyperinsulinism. Then the treatment based on 
the diagnosis, then we treat either medically or surgically. Of course, there will be uh, a need for providing a feeding plan uh, because those patients, as we said earlier, they would have recurrent hypoglycemias, and uh, we see how it goes with the treatment because sometimes medical treatment itself is not sufficient. They need to add some kind of uh, uh, slow releasing carbs uh, into their diet to prevent the hypoglycemia, especially at night. And then uh, in the management, well, there'll be a, an important aspect about glucose monitoring for those patients to predict when the hypoglycemia is happening or to prevent it, uh, to see the pattern and to treat accordingly. And that could be either by uh, measuring the blood glucose in the classical way, the traditional way, or uh, by continuous glucose monitoring as the technology advances these days. So through this kind of pathway, just an algorithm to go through, if we have a suspected hypoglycemia, or there is a patient with hypoglycemia or blood glucose less than 50 milligrams per deciliter or less than 3 millimole per liter, then we need to collect a critical sample. And based on the results that we're going to get, if the results showing that this uh, non-acidotic sample by carb is more than 18, then it's important to know what's the the three fatty acids and what is the beta hydroxybutyrate? Beta hydroxybutyrate can be measured on the bedside as well as a sample can be sent to the lab uh, for proper laboratory uh, uh, investigation. If we have non ketotic and uh, basically low, low uh, ketones in here and low fatty acids, non acidotic sample with hypoglycemia, so non ketotic hypoglycemia, likely that we are dealing with hyperinsulinism. The C peptide here can differentiate whether we're dealing with extremely rare condition, which is, can be exogenous injection of insulin, like in cases of mantrosin by proxy, or we're dealing with uh, endogenous hyperinsulinism. So basically, we would have elevated C peptide and insulin in such cases. Decrease hydroxybutyrate, but free fatty acids are high, then perhaps you are dealing with fatty acid oxidation data. If the sample is uh, acidotic with bicarb less than 15, look at the lactate. If the lactate is high, then perhaps you are dealing with gluconeogenesis defect, including glycogen storage disease type one or ethanol ingestion. If the ketones are high and the sample is acidotic, then perhaps you are dealing with ketotic hypoglycemia or glycogen, other types of glycogen storage disease, or could be cortisol deficiency. Of course, if the ICTH is high, then perhaps we are dealing with just primary adrenal disease. This is a critical sample. We need to collect a blood sample and urine sample. Blood sample, including a lab, a lab sample for the glucose, um, insulin C peptides, ketone bodies, and that, as I said, it can be done on the side, uh, red side as well. Free fatty acids, amino acids, lactate, ammonia, usually helping the differentiating metabolic causes. Ammonia, as in blood one mutation, as we mentioned earlier, bicarbonate will help you to say whether acidotic or non acidotic, as well as the rest of the, gas, the blood gas analysis. Um, Acylcarnitine to help with fatty acid oxidation disorder. Cortisol growth hormone to rule out other counteracting uh, mechanisms that should prevent the hypoglycemia from happening. And of course, uh, insulin growth factor binding protein one, which can be useful in diagnosing uh, congenital hyperinsulinism. The urine sample, uh, as well, the first void sample after the hypoglycemic uh, event could be helpful to check for reducing substances, ketone bodies, amino acids, and organic acids, mainly for metabolic process. Say, uh, so, so let's see here the biomarkers that are usually aiding the diagnosis of congenital hyperinsulinism. So on this ax, uh, axis, the blood glucose, on the y axis is plasma insulin. So if low glucose, supposed to be associated with high insulin, but that is not usual, that's not all, always. So as you see here, low glucose, but the insulin is, is not much high. So it's not necessary that with all cases of hyperinsulinism to have high insulin. It's enough to diagnose a case of congenital hyperinsulinism is to have any detected insulin inappropriately in terms of hypoglycemia. This is very important. Because sometimes we see labs saying the insulin is with normal uh, values within the normal range, but that is inappropriately normal. It shouldn't be within that normal range if the patient is hypoglycemic. Beta cells should be switched off. So any detectable insulin in terms of severe hypoglycemia, that is enough to, to, uh, to diagnose uh, hyperinsulinism. 
And this, uh, and this uh, graph, we see here the plasma beta-hydroxybutyrate and the plasma insulin. Here, the specificity and sensitivity is even higher than the uh, glucose and insulin. If you see here on the left upper corner, the insulin is high, but there is no hydroxybutyrate. So undetected beta-hydroxybutyrate in hyperinsulin, an example, that is enough to diagnose congenital hyperinsulinism as well. And in this graph, we see the IGF, uh, the insulin growth factor binding protein one. As you see here, uh, in types of uh, potassium ATP channel mutations, uh, congenital hyperinsulinism is most likely to see that you have low IGF one binding protein one. Whereas in cases of ketotic hypoglycemia, which is uh, is nothing to do with congenital hyperinsulinism, another cause of hypoglycemia you could see how it's detected IGF-1, IGF uh, binding protein 1. So that can be used another marker with very high sensitivity and specificity. Now to diagnose congenital hyperinsulinism, just to cap, we need to have low glucose, inappropriately detected insulin or C-peptide, and inappropriately low free fatty acids as well as beta-hydroxybutyrate. How could we manage those patients? So initially, while we are still establishing diagnosis, we treat the hypoglycemia by giving dextrose uh, infusion, as I mentioned, and then you put the patient on maintenance, and perhaps you need to titrate the amount of infused dextrose. Usually through the peripheral line, we give a, a dextrosity up to 12.5%. If it's more than 12.5%, we need a central line. If we reach a very high strength of dextrose, certainly we need a central uh, line in a very decent Vein, and so perhaps we need a surgical uh, access, a surgical line for those patients. To buy some time, we need to give sometimes uh, glucagon. And uh, unfortunately, glucagon is not that medication that we can give it very long time because of the stability of the drug. So we use it for short, short, term, short term until we establish a diagnosis perhaps. And especially if we have a problem with the fluid overload in patients with requiring very high glycemic uh, uh, glucose infusion rate. Uh, so we don't want to continue just giving large amount of fluids and the patients will have a fluid overload uh, that could lead to heart failure, for example. So if we need to minimize the amount of infused fluid, at that time we could give IV glucagon and usually the dose is five to 10 mics per kg per hour uh, intravenously. So it will give us some time to reach a diagnosis. Uh, and need to be aware that it can be rarely causing necrolytic mi uh, migratory erythema as it appears on this uh, picture. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, side effects usually disappears within two to three days after stopping the glucagon. The first line of management in patients with congenital hyperinsulinism is diazoxide, which is, you remember I showed you earlier the potassium ATP channel that uh, is closed by mutation, so dioxide is basically a channel opener, working on that channel, trying to make it work into uh, stop the depolarization that is occurring and le leading to calcium influx. We need to make sure that we have a baseline echocardiography to make sure this patient is al not already having pulmonary hypertension or uh, uh, an issues with ejection fraction of their hearts because diazoxide can lead to fluid retention. Therefore, by default, we usually give diuretics like chlorothiazide when we start the diazoxide. And the dose can be 5 to 15 milligram per kg per day in divided doses. Sometimes we give even smaller dose like 3 milligram per kg per day. And some patients, they do respond to that low dose. We need to be aware of the side effects of diazoxide, as I mentioned earlier, the fluid retention and pulmonary hypertension as well as the hypertrichosis, which is hepatitis, as it appears on this picture, sometimes hyperuricemia and sometimes very rarely, less than 2%, I would say, the bone marrow suppression, mainly thrombocytopenia and or suppression of the appetite. Then you would hear us talking a lot about whether this patient is diazoxide responsive or non diazoxide responsive. Uh, uh, so that could, because if the patient is diazoxide responsive, that will help us just carry on with the management. But if the patient is diazoxide unresponsive, then we need to move on to next steps of management. When would we say that? If the patient is able to generate ketones with blood glucose more than 2.8 or 3.3 millimole per liter, 
the idea is the patient is able to generate ketones. If the patient is able to generate ketones, means diazoxide has suppressed the insulin production. Because if there is high insulin, then the insulin is usually switching off the ketogenesis process. So if the patient is generating ketones, means the insulin has been suppressed. That, so that means that patient is responding to diazoxide. Or if the patient is able to fast for 18 hours with no hypoglycemia, or if the patient with the blood one mutation, for example, is able to have a meal of food containing protein without having hypoglycemia. So that means that the patient is responding to treatment. If the patient is not responding, then we move to the second line uh, therapy by giving octreotide, which is a somatostatin analog, and the dose usually is five to 40 mics per kg per day, but be given in divided three or four doses subcutaneously, or sometimes in certain patients, we do give it through the same like insulin pump. We use that pump to, to deliver the octreotide uh, subcutaneous infusion continuously 24-7. Preferably to be given when the baby is more than two months of age and it's proven it's non focal congenital hyperinsulinism. But do, we do sometimes, when diazoxide, for example, is not available, we do start octoritide at a, a younger age. Tachyphylaxis is common with octoritide. By the time the dose of octoritide can be not much effective as it used to be. And side effects of octoritide can suppress the growth hormone thyroid stimulating hormone and adenocortotrophic hormone as well. Gallbladder stones occurs about in 20, 30% of the cases. Transient transaminitis up to 40% of the cases and rarely thrombosis and necrotizing encephalitis. So as far as we are aware of these side effects and uh, with the complexity of uh, babies, especially if they are born premature, then we need to be careful when we give the octreotide to them. Other new medications like long-acting somatostatin analogs, uh, lan lanreotide, which is uh, the somatolin uh, autogel uh, given uh, by deep subcutaneous injections every four weeks, uh, or the uh, sandostatin LAR uh, can be given intramuscularly every four weeks. So that helps with adherence medication and better quality of life as well. Now we move to non-medical therapy is by, giving, by, by, by taking the patient to surgery. And we do this if it's a focal type so that uh, we will identify the focus that is leading to production of high insulin by having the uh, FDOPA scan, uh, which is a, one it's a type of uh, PET CT scan. So if you uh, identify the area that is uh, producing too much insulin, a uh, patient can be taken to uh, an expert surgeon who could be able to get that focus out, and usually the patient will be cured by, by, by the surgery. Um, and, and the other indication for the surgical intervention that you failed all medication attempts and, and the very severe diffuse uh, chai that is not responsive to whatever medication you tried. But we, we, we need to be bearing in mind the, the post-operative complications, like perhaps some beta cells, which is still uh, functioning uh, with uh, uh, no concordance uh, to the, the body and it's producing insulin, then patients would continue having hypoglycemia. On the long run, uh, patients could be developing the vice versa of hyperinsulinism, where they have insulin insufficiency having diabetes and uh, mellitus. And uh, of course, by removing almost 98% of the pancreas, then the patient could be at risk of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So this is the pathway that uh, we usually follow to assess the diazoxide response. If the patient is responsive, then we assess fasting tolerance. And if it's appropriate for age, then we discharge. So in neonates, for example, while the patient on diazoxide and maintained and everything is fine, stable, ready for discharge, we just make a six hours fast, making sure they pay the baby is passing this test to be safe at home, we discharge baby on diazoxide and then we'll arrange for follow-up. But if the patient is not responsive to diazoxide, it's important to run a rapid mutational analysis of ABCC8 and KCNJ11. Now, if it's paternally inherited, as we mentioned earlier, it could be focal, but if it's diffuse uh, and diffuse disease, it would be usually homozygous or combined and heterozygous of both mutations, then we will move to high calorie and uh, volume feeds plus octreotide therapy, plus we might end up, if patient is not responding medically, to near total pancreatic. 
can get affected. But if it's paternally inherited, then we, we will move uh, away with uh, the 18 uh, Afdoka PET CT scan. Um, unfortunately, it's not available in all countries. So there are, there are certain centers in the world where they perform this scan. If it's focal disease, then we do surgical resection, whether uh, laparoscopically if possible, depends on the skills of the surgeon that we have access to. And then that potentially leading to uh, curing of patients, but there's no guarantee. However, if the DOPA scan showing diffuse disease, then we go back to the square where patients would have high calorie and volume fees plus uh, octuretide. And if it's failed, then we move with the near, near total factor. Uh, if the patient is stable, as we mentioned earlier in the first arm, then uh, usually uh, just move on with follow up. However, if routine genetic analysis afterwards uh, with the gene panel that's uh, uh, resulted that there's a paternal ABCCA or KCMJ11 gene mutation, then we need to move the FDOFA scan here, but to get the surgical removal of that focus that produces too much of insulin. General follow up to monitor the growth and development, neurological assessment, and genetic counseling. Growth. Now, we need to uh, be aware of some common problems in patients with congenital hyperinsulinism. Uh, so feeding problem is very common in those patients, uh, food aversion or refusal, especially on those patients who require tube feeding for very long time. So if a patient is requiring nasogastric tube or orogastric tube for very long time, 75% of them they will have a food aversion in the future. So we need to be careful for them to develop these skills. So we let them at time of weaning to taste the food, to let them to swallow some food, and preferably not to keep the orogastric or nasogastric tube for a very long time. You can switch it to a fed percutaneous gastrostomy kind of tubing feeds, um, and then making sure that the skills are uh, gained through the oral uh, route as well. Uh, uh, this happens, the food aversion, uh, as mentioned, one of the reasons is long-term usage of tube feeds, but sometimes also can be resulted due to changes in the gastric motility um, and anorexigenic effect of insulin, or could be due to adverse side effects, gastrointestinal side effects of medications can be used, like octuretide or even diazoxide, or could be due to neurodevelopmental deficits. Now, education is very important, um, and we do educate our patients about congenital hyperinsulinism, and we provide them with the written material. Congenital hyperinsulinism international, they do amazing work, and um, I have translated this to them into Arabic. They do have congenital hyperinsulinism material in more than 17 languages. So you just need to visit their website, congenitalhy.org, to find out the education material that we can share with your patients. And it's very important to highlight to our patients and even our staff, uh, make them aware about uh, the symptoms and signs of hypoglycemia and what are the consequences of that happening. Now, after educating the parents and after discharging the patients, you need to monitor their glucose. So I would, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be one of the first people who studied the effect of continuous flash glucose monitoring in patients with congenital hyperinsulinism where we carried on this kind of research in Liverpool back in 2016-2017, uh, and we got this published first time, uh, uh, the effect of CGM on... Uh, so we got the first report on accuracy and patient experience. What we found is, comparing to the capillary blood glucose, and here are the differences between the uh, freestyle library to the capillary blood glucose. Ideally, we should not find a difference uh, more than plus two, minus two standard deviation. But what we found, we see red plots here. So there are sometimes differences, whether it's over red or under red uh, readings through the uh, freestyle library. But that, at the time, we used the first generation of the freestyle library. Uh, resulted in having mean absolute relative, relative difference of 17.9%. Of course, the lower MARD is the better um, way of, of measurement. So ideally, you should get the reading only on the green line, not to see anything on the, on the orange, the yellow, orange, or red. But as you see here, there were some readings follow, falling in there. So we considered the MAD is high, and we could not uh, recommend uh, the uh, continuous glucose monitoring at the time, 
uh, uh, for accuracy from accuracy point of view. However, the parents um, were very happy to use this type of uh, glucose monitoring to know the trend of the glucose of their kids, what's, what's going to happen to them. And so what is the prediction is going to be. Later on, researchers start working on this area, so continuous glucose monitoring and management of neonates with persistent hypoglycemia congenital hyperinsulinemia by Mayat Nguyen in 2021, they found the mean absolute relative difference is down to 11%. Um, and there is another uh, study was published in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics. Uh, again, this uh, from 2020, a three-way accuracy comparison of Dexcom G5, the uh, Three Star Library Pro, and uh, the Eversense, and their mark, uh, the Three Star Library was similar to our study. Dexcom slightly better, but Eversense was even better. A very recent publication just this month by Madini with uh, a Pratik Shah uh, group from uh, London. Uh, they checked the accuracy and impact using Dexcom 5 and Dexcom 6, and they found the MAR is actually lower to down to 12.8%. So it could be there is some degree of accuracy uh, with improvement of the technology here and the checking uh, glucose, especially with. Um, uh, real-time glucose. Um, so uh, those uh, those results is very encouraging to use technology these days and in monitoring a glucose. At the end, I would like to thank you again for the invitation, and I will leave you this photo from the Aspid region where we met last year, trying to establish congenital hyperinsulinism registry in uh, Middle East and North Africa. And I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Dr. Hashim, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, actually, um, the, my first patient with HI, I was diagnosed twelve years ago. He was put on sandostatin for years, uh, short acting one, one, and then has been shifted to LAR, and he was doing excellent on LAR. Do you have any experience in using LAR? And instead of sandostatin, the short acting. Um, I haven't got uh, my own experience of using blood, but uh, if you, if your patient is is uh, stable on that, and you're saying that he's got excellent uh, response to it, so uh, perhaps you've reached uh, the the optimum of his management. Yes, he was he was responding excellent, even for the short acting ones, and then on blood, he was doing very fine, but. Then he developed pancreatitis. Ah. I okay. don't know if it is due to, as you know, some of the manager for pancreatitis, but I wasn't sure why did he develop pancreatitis. Few months later, he was off sandostatin and he was doing excellent. Also, I did the genetics in extern 12 years ago. This one was my first patient, and diagnosis is made. Yeah. Okay, so was it, do you but think it, it was dose related, for example, with this uh, lab? The dose was less, I think. Okay. And glucose was, uh, values was better than before, than on the regular ones. It was very strange for me. Okay, uh, you said you use uh, statin as well with it? No, statin at first. Somatostatin, yeah. No, sandostatin at first, yes. And then uh, the large one. And then of large. Okay. A, a bit strange to me because as you know, in others, I, I do remember they used somatostatin in treatment of even acute pancreatitis. So they used yes, somatostatin yes, in yes. treatment that's rather why, than causing the pancreatitis. No, that's why I continued on somatostatin. Yeah. And at, at the time of pancreatitis, did you investigate for other causes of pancreatitis? Could be a, a reason. Could. Yes. Uh, uh, no, I didn't reach a reason for this pancreatitis. Wow. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. And I presume after that you restarted the, the LAR again, 
and yes. it didn't happen again. So it wasn't a, like a recurrent uh, pancreatitis. Yes. So in, in this case, perhaps uh, the uh, the, the uh, pancreatitis was not secondary to this medication. Yes. And that's most likely. Yeah. yeah. But he when when he was off centrostatin, I was very astonished. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We really enjoyed your uh, presentation. Uh, uh, we hope to meet you again soon. I know that you are doing an excellent job on uh, either on the national level, man, or Arab level, or ISBAD level, or even SP. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.